It's time for the Thorngene Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, brought to you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. A presentation of the Longine Whitnor Watch Company, maker of Longine, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world honored Longine. Good evening. This is Frank Knight. May I introduce our co editors for this edition of the Longine Chronoscope? Mr. William Bradford Huey, editor of the American Mercury, and Colonel Ansel Talbert, an editor of the New York Herald Tribune. Our distinguished guest for this evening is the Honorable Frank C. Pace, Jr., Secretary of the Army. The opinions expressed are thoroughly those of the speaker. Mr. Pace, for several days, the newspapers have reflected some optimism over the possibilities of the troops in Korea. Now, as Secretary of the Army, sir, do you have anything very hopeful to say to our audience tonight for the possibilities of a truce in Korea? I think, uh, Mr. Huey, it's important that I should say that I don't think the American people should try to evaluate the changes that occur from day to day. I think it's important that we wait until we find out what ultimately happens. We are seeking an honorable peace. We are hopeful that we will get it. We're making every effort. Until we do get it, I think that over-optimism or over-pessimism is unwarranted. Well, yeah. Mr. Uh, Secretary, are we learning anything from the Korean War? A great deal, Colonel Talbert. There's just no question about it. Over in Korea, we've learned a lot about night fighting, about fighting guerrillas, about the Chinese mass attack and how to meet it. We've learned a lot about the use of new weapons that we didn't even have before Korea started. I think it's fair to say that Army Air uh, uh, tactical support has improved tremendously during the period of Korean operation. And don't forget that for the first time in history, we've learned how to fight for free nations under the United Nations. That, in my judgment, is an important factor. Are you saying sir, that, uh, that there are the American people have gained something from Korea? That there are real plus values in Korean fighting? Unquestionably. There are big plus values. You, you, you admit, you, you candidly admit that, uh, that since we are at war, you are trying to use it as a training ground. Just no question that since we are at war, we are trying to profit in every way to make America and the United Nations stronger. We've rotated 250,000 men out of Korea, 250,000 trained veterans that make this a stronger nation. That's one of many benefits that have come from a war that we did not seek and that we would like to end honorably. How's the morale of our troops over there, Mr. Secretary? It's a matter of, of, of real marvel to me, high morale of the troops over there. Every man who goes over there, not to just uh, military people, but people who are normally critically minded come back and say that the morale of the troops is unbelievable. It's an unattractive country. It's a difficult war. But the courage, the morale of the young man of America is to me the most encouraging thing that I've seen in this whole period. Mr. I just want to say the communists thought we were soft. They thought they could drive us into the sea. The young man of America gave them the lie. And frankly, I'm proud to be Secretary of the Army for that as well as a lot of other reasons. Uh, one other point that our people, I think our audience has noted, there's been a, a feeling uh, particularly in the last week or two, that if we don't get a truce, that we are going to fight a more aggressive war, that uh, steps are going to be taken uh, to make it uh, harder on the enemy. Now, uh, is that a correct assumption? Well, let me say this. Uh, what our plans are, I don't think it's wise for me or anybody else to reveal. I think it is uh, fair to say that we have given this matter careful consideration. We do know uh, what our plans are in the event of certain alternatives. Stating them, it seems to me, is unwise at this time. Mr. Uh, Secretary, we have been hearing a lot about atomic artillery. Have we really got anything in that department? We certainly have. Uh, we have uh, not actually fired uh, an atomic missile. We have fired uh, the equivalent of it. We know of the accuracy, the competence of this particular weapon to operate with devastating power in all kinds of weather, night or day. I think it is a substantial implement to our total uh, arsenal of weapons. 
Now, is atomic warfare uh, important to the Army now, or is the Army attaching a great deal of importance to the development of atomic weapons? Tremendous importance to the development of atomic weapons. We're working with our two sister services in this field. The atomic artillery is only one facet of the Army's interest in this field. We have a very definite interest, a very aggressive interest in the guided missile field, and I think it's fair and honest to say that we have made really tremendous progress in this field. One other thing that has been bothering our audience, I'm sure, and that is the possible effect of the steel strike on our war effort. Now, uh, has the war effort been hurt by the steel strike as yet, sir? Well, I can say it's been bothering me. And I think uh, that the best way to describe it is to say that if you speak about today, the war effort has not been affected. The best way I know to describe it is to say that if you settle the steel strike tomorrow, you'd still be feeling the results of the steel strike on the war effort three, four, five months from now. So in other words, it's something that projects itself into the future. So as, as one, of our, one of the directors of our war effort, you state candidly that you have suffered from the steel strike already. Unquestionably in terms of the long range war effort plan. And, and if the steel strike is not settled soon, why it can be really serious for you, can No it? question about it. Looking at the overall picture, do you think we're any closer to a general war now than we were a year ago? That's probably one of the most difficult questions you could ask any man. Uh, if I had to answer that question, my judgment would be that uh, we are certainly uh, no closer to it and I think a little further away from it. I'd like to expand on that just for a moment if I may. It's very good news. I, I feel that uh, our strength has grown tremendously in the course of the past two years. Not just in terms of the things that we have produced, but in terms of our capability to produce. In terms of the developments that we've had in the research and development field, and in terms of our development in terms of trained manpower. I feel we are infinitely stronger and I don't think all of the evidence is tangible. I think much of it is intangible. Men who have had fighting experience, men who have had two years training, the plants that have been expanded threefold, fourfold and fivefold mean that this is a stronger, more powerful nation today. I think that there is a strong will I think that the free world has been tested. I think it's been the effort of Soviet Russia to test us. And I think that we have to date met the test in a fashion that, that should be, it seems to me, satisfying to a great many people in this country. I say it is to me, and while I would not want to be categorical in answer to your original question, I say that if I had to evaluate it, I would say we were a little further away. Mr. Pace, since you are Secretary of the Army, uh, let me ask you this, sir. Uh, the trend, uh, a great deal has been said about the trend being away from armies and about the Army of the United States perhaps having to take a back seat to the Navy or the Air Force. Now, as a matter of fact, uh, where do you stand now as regards expenditures in relation to the Air Force and the Navy? Well, as regards expenditures, I would say we uh, stand, uh, uh, Air Force will probably expend more money in 1953, Army number two and the Navy number three. In terms of appropriations for 1953, the Army stands third on the list. So it is a fact now that we are appropriating uh, less money now for the Army than for either the Navy or the Air Force. That's right. I point out that the Congress appropriated more money for the Army in 51 than either of the other two services and we were number two in 1952. Is there are, you, any? are you satisfied with this situation, Mr. Secretary? Well, uh, uh, <laughs> any Secretary of the Army who said he was satisfied with the funds given to him would not be speaking the complete truth. I do want to say this. I am perfectly aware of the tremendous problem that faced the people who had to make the ultimate decision. In my opinion, they made the decision honestly in what they thought was the best interest of the country. I don't think there's any value in my evaluating whether that was wise or unwise. All I can say to you is my job to take what I've got and spend it as intelligently and as carefully as is possible in the months and uh, days ahead.
Has there been any appreciation, have you noticed uh, any uh, falling off of morale among army men uh, as a result of the fact that you are number three now in appropriation? Not one whit. Remember, we aren't number three in expenditures, and remember, we got combat duty pay for the man on the ground. I say army morale is high. Now that combat duty pay, is that means that your combat soldiers get paid more than a soldier that's not in combat? That's right. And that's something I believed in, something I fought for, and something I think is completely equitable. How much more does it, what, can you tell us what a combat... $50. A combat soldier gets $50 Six, a month? That's, that's correct. Uh, $50 a month more. That's right. I think maybe 45 or 50. I'm not sure of the exact sum. I think maybe it's 45. Well, there's a final question, sir. Uh, what, do, what does the Army want from the American people now? Do you want uh, universal military training? Do you want more money? Or what does the Army want tonight, sir? Uh, tonight, the Army just wants the confidence and support of the American people. If we have that, we'll ask for no more than we need, and we'll give them uh, uh, what I think uh, is necessary in this period. All we want from the American people is their confidence and support. We could use UMT, too. <coughs> and it, <coughs> does the Army expect to fight for UMT in the, the next Congress? The Army will fight for UMT. I believe in it, and I'll fight for it. And you think that uh, with the world, with the realities such as they are today, that, that we need it in order to safeguard the country? I don't think you can afford to be without it. It's the cheapest means of providing manpower reserve strength. Well, I'm sure that our audience very much appreciates your forthright views, Mr. Pace, and thank you for being with us, sir. The editorial board for this edition of the Longine Chronoscope was Mr. William Bradford Huey and Colonel Ansel E. Talbert. Our distinguished guest was the Honorable Frank C. Pace, Jr., Secretary of the Army. You know, many thousands of men like to think of a watch as a permanent possession, to be worn for years and years, and then perhaps proudly handed down to Junior. Now, if you feel this way, the watch for you is the world's most honored watch. Longine, for the longer life of Longine watches, is well known to every watchmaker in the world. Long life and greater accuracy are the results of superior workmanship. The excellence of manufacture, which has won for Longine 10 World's Fair grand prizes, 28 gold medals, and fame throughout the globe as the world's most honored watch. Every Longine watch is manufactured so as to be individually worthy of all the great honors which have been bestowed upon the name Longines during 86 years of brilliant performance. Beautiful to behold, Longines watches have the qualities which make for firm friendships. For yourself, for any gift occasion, no other name on a watch means so much as Longines, the world's most honored watch, premier product of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company since 1866, maker of watches of the highest character. We invite you to join us every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday evening at this same time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, broadcast on behalf of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world-honored Longines. This is Frank Knight, reminding you that Longines and Whitnor watches are sold and serviced from coast to coast by more than 4,000 leading jewelers who proudly display this emblem, Agency for Longines Whitnor Watches. This is the CBS Television Network.